Dear friends, we come now to the fourth chapter in The Reckoning That Counts, which has mainly to do with the work of the Holy Spirit as he applies to our lives the truth that we count upon, the truth that we reckon upon. But before we get into the chapter, I would like to commend two very important books on this very important subject. If you want, if you don't have them, you might jot these titles down, and I'm sure you can get them at your local Christian bookstore. The first one is by Merle Unger, Dr. Unger, the title of the Holy Spirit. And I feel if you had read the book, I'm sure it will uh, serve a real purpose in your life and may straighten out a lot of questions that you might have concerning the Holy Spirit. Very important book. The Baptizing Work of the Holy Spirit by Merle Unger. It's a fairly new book. It's been out maybe a couple of years at the most. And then the other book is an older book by Samuel Rideout. R-I-D-O-U-T. Samuel Rideout. The person and work of the Holy Spirit. And that can be gotten in paperback. The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit. These two books, by Unger and Rideout, are very important, and I'd feel much better if you uh, were to study them. And if you have uh, questions or you're concerned about this problem of tongues and healers, I've written a book called The Red Letters that you can get from me. It's a 50 cent book titled The Red Letters. And my address is in the back of the reckoning book and you can send for that if you need some help along those lines. Well now in getting into this chapter four, third item Think about the Holy Spirit. Of course, the Holy Spirit. But he's never to be referred to as Holy Ghost. That's an old English archaic uh, title from James, and it's not right at all. He only is referred to as such: the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And there's so much here about the characteristics uh, of His being where the Lord Jesus said to the disciples, Nevertheless, when he, the Spirit of Truth, is coming, and the Lord Jesus calls him here the Spirit of Truth, and uh, he's the one who wrote the Bible, he's the one who is uh, ministers truth to us. The Spirit of Truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That's his ministry. Now this thought here. For he shall not speak of himself. And that's one reason why it's so hard to really get to know the Holy Spirit is because he stays in the background and his basic ministry is to glorify the Lord Jesus and glorify him in and through each Christian. The Word says that the Lord Jesus said in the Word, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Well, the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit is that when he shows us something of the Lord Jesus, he doesn't just show it to us as truth in the Word that he does for the basis of our faith, but he he makes the things of the Lord Jesus Christ real in our lives. He gives us the reality. He's the Spirit of Christ, and he's brought the life of the Lord Jesus within our spirit. And as we grow in Christ, why the Lord Jesus 
is more and more manifest in and through us. He takes over more fully in our new life so that he gives us the truth, but of course the truth, the Lord Jesus is the truth, and he gives us the reality of that truth as we grow. <clears throat> now if we can turn over to um, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. There's some things there that we should think about for a moment together. 1 Corinthians 2.9, along this same thought about the Holy Spirit, that as we see the truth, as he opens up the truth to us in the Word, we count upon that truth, and we depend upon the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to make that truth real in our makeup, in our character, in our new life, in our growth. In verse 9 here in 1 Corinthians 2, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The things which God hath prepared, already prepared for the believer. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And as the Christian grows and as he studies the Word, why, the Holy Spirit reveals to us uh, the finished work. <clears throat> the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is our life, the fact that we're complete in Him, the fact that we're accepted in Him, the fact that we're secure in Him, the fact that the, Holy, the Lord Jesus is seeking to conform us to his image, that we might be more and more like him. And this is all the ministry of the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, deep within our spirit. And in verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. <clears throat> And the only way that the Christian can ever find out anything about God, anything about the Lord Jesus, any truth, he must find it out through the ministry of the Holy Spirit by means of the Word. <coughs> There's no other way. The Holy Spirit is the one who ministers truth. He's the only one. That's his ministry. the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Well, it's good to see those two words, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And it's hard for the Christian to get the get used to the idea that get used to the truth that um, everything that God gives us is free, and the reason for that is that we can't earn them in the first place. Where we're going to get them, they must be given to us as a gift. And the second reason, and really the main reason, is that He's already uh, <clears throat> prepared all of these things in Christ. Everything that God has for us is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's already prepared and all paid for, if there's any payment required. The work of the cross paid for everything, so that it's all freely given to us. And the fact is that everything that we ever need <clears throat> in our Christian life is already given to us, all available in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ours for the asking, ours for the need. As we grow and as we come upon the needs, it's all uh, geared, all laid out as we develop, as the Holy Spirit takes us along. <clears throat> so these are wonderful facts, friends, 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We think of the uh, wonderful truth there in uh, Romans 8.32. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, it's, a, it's wonderful to realize that God is for us. And the basis upon which he is for us, the fact that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, by his work at the cross and his life, the fact that we're in him, uh, everything has been taken out of the way that would keep God from being for us. The whole problem of sin has been settled, and now God is free to love us and uh, take us along. And he's also free to deal with us when things come up in our lives. He deals with us, but he deals with us in love on the basis of the finished work of the cross. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And there's that same thought. Everything is free. He freely gives us all things, all the things that we need. And it is uh, with Christ, with him also freely give us all things, that everything is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ, and everything is ministered by the Spirit of Christ. <clears throat> well, uh, for the Christian who may have been going through a long, barren and needy and hungry and thirsty uh, period, this is mighty good news to him or her, to realize, begin to realize, that God is just waiting to give. And uh, the Christian may have been begging and pleading and working and seeking to merit this and that, that he might feel that he needs from God. God just has to wait until the Christian comes to realize that God has already done and given that which he's begging for, and he's waiting for the Christian to see it in the Word, realize it, and uh, begin to settle down and trust him for it, to reckon upon that truth, count upon it, because God doesn't need the, the Christian's uh, begging prayers. He needs his uh, prayer of faith. And the Christian can't exercise faith. He can't reckon upon that which he doesn't really know about. He can't reckon upon a truth that he's not sure of and he doesn't see clearly. So God uh, waits and uh, works in our hearts and brings us around to the truth that we might walk and live and grow by faith, <coughs> faith in the facts. And then there's a further encouragement here in Ephesians 2.10, uh, for we are God's workmanship, <coughs> and we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And there's that preparation that all that God has in mind for us in our Christian walk, in our Christian service, Christian life, he's uh, ordained it all beforehand. He doesn't pour us into a mold and force us along. He's worked it out so that it is practically just as though there were no plan and that we were uh, learning about it and uh, praying about it and seeking our his guidance and all and depending upon the Holy Spirit. And it seems as though it's all dependent, uh, depending upon us uh, in order for us to find out and to follow through in our Christian life uh, God's will for us. But underneath it all, God is, uh, has it all planned. But he works his plan out uh, through our faith and through our depending upon the Holy Spirit. For we are his workmanship. For it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. For we are his workmanship, and we've been created anew, recreated, in Christ Jesus. He is the source of our life. And the good works, well, naturally, anything that has to do with the Lord Jesus is good, and good works, uh, good products, good results, everything. He's holy, he's uh, pure, he's righteous, and everything that springs from him is uh, perfect. created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, that's our, our part of it, that we, we find out, we see 
we learn more about the Lord Jesus and we realize that he's the source of our life and we depend upon him and we depend upon the Spirit of Christ to uh, guide us and lead us and uh, take us along that the Lord Jesus might be more and more manifest manifested in our daily life not I but Christ now in our chapter <clears throat> there are some things to a few things to think about the fact that the Holy Spirit is uh, called a comforter well we need that friends we really do uh, many people feel that uh, the Holy Spirit is vindictive and that he's going to punish and uh, they don't really know him as comforter many Christians well the, the Holy Spirit does have to be firm with us often in our sin he must convict us of our sin and turn us to the Lord Jesus and his shed blood that we might be cleansed that we might confess our sin that we might be brought, brought back into fellowship that we can continue growing that's true but in it all he comforts us and he causes us to realize that uh, God is for us God understands God is not going to tolerate sin but he he deals with our sin in the Lord Jesus he dealt with our sin on the cross and uh, any dealings that he has to do with us because of our sin is all in love and it's all for our development of course the enemy seeks to pour guilt upon us and uh, turn us away from the remedy by uh, seeking to force us to try to make up for our sin or uh, to continue bearing the burden of it and to uh, keep us from realizing that the Lord Jesus is waiting to uh, give us a benefit of the shed blood and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness but underneath it all the Holy Spirit is a comforter and when we learn uh, truths that have to do with our growth and we learn to count upon them we begin to get the results of that faith of those truths and of course the first point in reckoning is to reckon ourselves to have died indeed unto sin and the second point of reckoning is to reckon ourselves to be alive unto God in Christ death to the old life and life in the new so that when we do begin to count ourselves to have died in Christ and count self to have been crucified at Calvary we're going to be taken down into a daily crucifixion there's going to be a death the death of Calvary applied to our old life it's going to be difficult and uh, there's uh, suffering entailed but underneath it all when we realize what's uh, happening there's the comfort of the Holy Spirit and there's the joy to realize well uh, the Holy Spirit is dealing with self and self is my greatest enemy and I I have glory in the cross and I rejoice in the fact that I'm being uh, progressively freed from the domination of the old life within. And as that uh, process goes on, there's more freedom to live in the Lord Jesus. The death of the old uh, is the groundwork for the resurrection life of the new. So it's interesting to see how God works here on page 21 we have these two points point one we reckon upon having died unto sin and are always delivered unto death that's the outworking of, of that uh, position of death if we believe that we died on, on Calvary and if we believe itself was crucified on Calvary uh, count upon it we begin to experience that right now here in our daily walk and then we count upon the fact that we are alive unto God in Christ the second half of Romans 6 11 and we get the results of 2nd Corinthians 4 11 as we count ourselves as being alive unto God in Christ 
the result is that the life also of Jesus is uh, more and more manifested in our mortal flesh. We count upon him as our life, and he begins to reveal himself as our life in our daily walk. Well, how does God uh, work this process out? When we believe a fact, how does the Holy Spirit make those facts uh, manifest in our walk? Well, it's very simple, very wonderful. Um, <clears throat> we begin to count ourselves to have died unto sin at the cross, and God brings the process of death into our daily life. He, uh, the Holy Spirit will uh, bring tribulation in our home life or work or wherever it might be in our ministry. And we must always remember that the word tribulation, tribulation in the word really means child training. That whatever the tribulations are in God's hands, they're, they're training, they're child training, and they're ministered in love from the very hand of our Father by uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Tribulation, trial, child training. Very wonderful fact to realize. So that um, we're not to be upset when tribulation comes. True, the tribulation might be ministered as a result of our sin. As a matter of fact, uh, we sin and do something wrong. It may, the result of it may take us into tribulation. But that is uh, part of God's process to uh, teach us and to cause us to grow. <clears throat> and we find out that uh, one of the results of uh, God's tribulation is that uh, it teaches us patience. We learn patience through tribulation. That God applies it and there's nothing we can do about it and we have to uh, go through with it. And it, it, it builds up patience in our lives. It brings out in our life the patience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think for a moment here of Romans 5, uh, 3, where Paul says, We glory, we glory in tribulations. And uh, you know how he mentions in Galatians six fourteen, I glory in the cross through which I am crucified unto the world, and the world crucified unto me. Paul gloried in the cross because he realized the work of the cross is separating uh, him separating him from the self-life, the power of sin. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh, worketh patience, and patience experience. Well, that's what, that's what Christians need, of course. Um before we really begin to grow, and uh, in the, especially in the early days, and maybe some Christians might say yes, and in the latter day too, uh, there's a tremendous need for patience uh, in the family, in the home, with the children and all, and the husband and wife, and all of these things. A tremendous need for patience. I have learned and am learning and uh, I like to remind other Christians that in this matter of patience uh, sometimes we'll act on something and uh, do something about something and we often find out that if we just waited another day that the, the, th the situation would have changed and worked out and uh, if we only hadn't acted so quickly on our own to resist this situation or uh, rectify it if we just waited another day, we would have seen the Lord work it out and work it out right. And I like, uh, someday I might have a little card printed for that, on that. If we had only waited, uh, just wait one more day. It's quite a lesson to learn. But this wonderful truth in Romans 5, 3, we learn to glory in our tribulations because we find out that tribulation works patience, and we certainly can't work it up ourselves. We can't manufacture it. We don't have it in ourselves. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, God happens to use these means. The Holy Spirit applies these things in order to work these aspects of the life of the Lord Jesus 
in us. He uses these means. He just doesn't push a button and all of a sudden we have plenty of patience. No, never. There, there are certain principles upon which God works. And tribulation happens to be the law and the principle that he uses to develop patience in us. And we will have gone a long ways in patience uh, once we see this and acquiesce to this fact. Uh, it, it'll do a lot for our patience right then and there when we are taken into tribulation, into child training. And then there's another uh, means that the Holy Spirit uses as we're reckoning upon, accounting upon ourselves of having died at Calvary, reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, that he uh, often, he'll send suffering. It might be physical suffering, it might be mental suffering, it might be spiritual suffering. Physical suffering is the main type of thing this is not at all. And like my head, hanging, we're uh, suffering that he sent. I mean, we're only uh, multiplying the problem if we worry and fret about situations. We only have to suffer the self-applied. But the suffering, for one thing, suffering that he takes us into, is uh, it brings forth comfort, uh, the comfort of God, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're not going to need comfort, not again, comfort, never. And plus, plus the fact that we're ready to be sure in the time in tiny, we never heard uh, the come God was. We hear that in Christ 1, 3, 2nd, 1, 3, 4. <coughs> Said fathers, well, our father Adam and the earth, father of mercies, father of And blessed be the father of mercies and the God of all, God of all comfort. All comfort comes from God. But us, all our tribulation and all of our child training, Why? That we may be able to comfort them who are in any trouble. How? By the comfort with which we ourselves comfort it. So we, we can't share with others that which we haven't first received. We uh, Holy Spirit can't share reality through us until it, that factor is real. Real to us. It's the only one who shares with others. <clears throat> and that's why, speaking when young Christians, so we learn to others to say, it's about the person, person that comes upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit when we're born again. Oh my, what about my mom and dad? What about the children and all? Brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, all of our acquaintances, we're, we're busy right away uh, witnessing and testifying and seeking to win them to the Lord. Sometimes the Lord does give us a soul in, the, in those early days. Someone who... Uh, he, but the thing is that we often get out of our realm or, and too before we can rise and draw better but and say, strengthen me not and know them what I'm talking about. But the day that we're about to us, we're more than a burden hard to And though they need to rely a burden generated by the needs of us, it means that the Holy Spirit us to dig into the Word and to uh, gain a better use of our of the sword of the Lord and to allow the Holy Spirit to bring more reality in our lives so that uh, those to whom we witness can watch us and uh, see whether or not there's any uh, anything behind uh, what we say. We are alive to being born again. New creation crisis. And of course, uh, others have a right to wait and to see. We know the Lord is true. The right does. And our testimony is used of a whole of helping sense. And they have a right to judge and to make up their own minds. Uh, this matter of soul winners uh, going about with their high power methods of uh, memorizing verses and so forth, and then uh, certain methods of soul winning and uh, applying these uh, methods upon the, like an arm lock on the poor lost sinners and bringing them to a decision or a commitment or something is is very tragic. 
ends in the and uh, every day with a little training. But for the most part, not the life behind the message. Life and that is not to freely work through that life as he honors the word. So uh, always when my process goes that there is something behind what we are hearing, something one that we have that is true of us. And of course that doesn't only do have to do that probably went to the hospital and do our ministry in sharing with our people. Which is. And then there's another means that the Holy Spirit uses in our, as we reckon upon the death aspect of the cross. He'll uh, place us in situations where there's a lot of sacrifice called for. Others need help. And we're the ones that they turn to. Sacrifice, but the, this very sacrifice and what it costs us in many ways, it will develop in us uh, his unselfishness. We're delivered unto death that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. All these uh, tribulations and all these uh, suffering and all this sacrifice that we're being taken into by the Holy Spirit is simply to not only deal with a self-life and bring it down to uh, into death, into the place of being inoperative, but also to develop and manifest the life of the Lord Jesus within us, because his resurrection life springs out of that death. So that uh, as we're taken into sacrifice, why the Holy Spirit develops within us unselfishness and understanding and the love for others. I think of First John 3.16 that uh, the Lord Jesus laid down his life for us that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And we're often called upon to sacrifice in many ways. But of course when the Christian is really growing and uh, his heart is filled with the love of the Lord why he never thinks of sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice doesn't enter into the picture. If the Lord wants this or wants that, why he's it's a privilege to share and to give so that unselfishness is developed in us, the life also of Jesus in our mortal flesh. And then there is a further aspect that we, as growing Christians, are taken into by the Holy Spirit as we count ourselves to have died at Calvary. He'll send, he'll send loneliness. Uh, loneliness is a very important aspect in Christian development for a number of reasons. One thing, that the fact that we're Christians camping in this world that belongs to the enemy, we're this is not our home. Our home is in glory. Our home is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our environment. So we're really out of our environment here on this earth, and we're just sojourners on our way through. And we're in the camp of the enemy. and uh, So it's, as far as that is concerned, we're, as far as the world is concerned, we're lonely. Uh, self is right at home in the world, but uh, the new life in the Lord Jesus has new creations in Christ. We're not at home in this world. That life can never be at home in this world. So there's a, a heart loneliness that is underlying all of the Christian life. And then, of course, there's a loneliness in connection with uh, worldlings, people, who the unsaved. We can't have fellowship with them. There's no rapport there, really. We are burdened for them and all, and we seek to win them and witness to them. But there's no fellowship there. There's no oneness there. There's a loneliness as far as we're concerned. And then, too, as a Christian is hungry to grow, and he begins to find out more about the facts of Christ being his life, and the more the Holy Spirit works within him, there's a loneliness uh, between himself and other Christians who are not yet ready to grow, who have not come along to the place where they're hungry. There's misunderstanding there often amongst Christians. 
And the very ones we seek to have fellowship with uh, are not able to have fellowship with us. Uh, they're not ready yet, and there's a there's a keen keen loneliness there. But it's it's strengthening. Even in our stand for the Word of God and the Lord Jesus, uh, there are many who are not ready or not able and not willing to stand firm for the Word of God, especially these days. There, everything seems to be breaking down and there's a, uh, everything's becoming gray and in generalities so that we can all be one, as they say, this ecumenical spirit. So that the one who stands for the Word of God and stands for the Lord Jesus Christ firmly, he's going to find himself very lonely today. As far as other Christians, many other Christians are concerned, as far as many professors are concerned, professors of religion, church people, and as far as the world is concerned, standing for the Lord Jesus Christ quietly and very lonely. But there's a uh, wonder. That's the uh, death part of it. That's the negative aspect. But that results in the positive. That results in the life aspect. The loneliness there brings uh, fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. If we're all taken up with the world and uh, every kind of belief and all kinds of uh, uh, brotherhood, you might say, even amongst uh, Christians, many Christians who are not growing. Our time is taken up, our attention is taken up, and the, 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 the Holy Spirit is not free to give us the fellowship with the Lord Jesus that we so badly need. It's uh, one or the other. We can't have both. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to give us the things of Christ, not the things of the world, not the things of uh, the gray realm of theology and all. No, he's a spirit of truth. He, he's the one who really stands for the Word of God. He doesn't deviate one iota. So if we're going to gain the benefit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we must stand for the truth and we must keep our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Fellowship with Him. That's what loneliness brings. That's why often the Holy Spirit takes us into loneliness to teach us that the Lord Jesus is the answer to uh, every aspect of our life. I've just discovered that there's something else on this tape. I don't know how that happened, but I trust you'll forgive it, and I trust it hasn't been uh, noticeable enough to really matter. Uh, it'll save me doing all this over, which I wouldn't mind too much, but I've been under a bronchial virus for eight weeks now, and just getting back to where I should be, not quite, but I've gone ahead and started this series anyway, and I want to get through it, and I think I can if I don't do too many tapes over, so I'm sure you'll understand. I want to share a bit of poetry with you that I have here on this matter of loneliness. It's called A Solitary Way. You may know of it. I've used it for many years in the correspondence work, sharing with Christians and their need. I want to read it to you <coughs> as best I can. There is a mystery in human hearts, and though we be encircled by a host of those who love us well and are beloved, to every one of us from time to time there comes a sense of utter loneliness. Our dearest friend is stranger to our joy and cannot realize our loneliness. There is not one who really understands, not one to enter into all I feel. Such is the cry of each one of us in turn. 
We wander in a solitary way, no matter what or where our lot may be. Each heart, mysterious even to itself, must live its inner life in solitude. And would you know the reason why this is? It is because the Lord desires our love. In every heart he wishes to be first. He therefore keeps the secret key himself to open all its chambers and to bless with perfect sympathy and holy peace each solitary soul which comes to him. So when we feel this loneliness, it is the voice of Jesus saying, Come to me. And every time we are not understood, it is a call to us to come again. For Christ alone can satisfy the soul, and those who walk with him from day to day can never have a solitary way. And when beneath some heavy cross you faint and say, I cannot bear this load alone, you say the truth. Christ made it purposely so heavy that you must return it to him. The bitter grief which is which no one understands conveys a secret message from the king, entreating you to come to him again. The man of sorrows understands it well, in all points tempted he can feel with you. You cannot too off, come too often or too near. The Son of God is infinite in grace. His presence satisfies the longing soul, and those who walk with him from day to day can never have a solitary way. Well, it's so interesting and so wonderful the way the Lord works, how he adjusts everything. Loneliness has a very definite part in our development. The Lord Jesus was lonely, as we know, so that if we're going to develop in his image and uh, his life is going to be manifested in us, there's going to be loneliness. And often, in order for loneliness to do its work within our lives, he seems to withdraw himself and he seems to more or less cut off our fellowship. And uh, this is done on purpose by him so that the loneliness will register. And there are often uh, extended times of uh, such suffering. while the Holy Spirit ministers this to our lives to develop us. And uh, those are the times that we are to learn to trust him just because he's trustworthy and to rest in him because he's faithful. Our faith in him and our trust in him and our rest in him is certainly never going to really develop if he makes things easy for us all the time and... Uh, we never have any pressures, never have any reason to uh, have to trust him in the face of uh, contrary feelings and uh, circumstances. So from time to time, uh, the Holy Spirit seems to uh, cut us off from God. It uh, seems as though God doesn't uh, care about us. But of course, uh, Every Christian who knows God at all knows differently than that, knows better than that. And we can turn here to uh, 2 Corinthians 4.15 for a few thoughts along that line. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4.15 <clears throat> uh, For all things are for your sakes. Well, there's uh, Romans 8.28 staring at us from that verse. We compare spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Spirit has the entire Word all tied together. There are certain principles that run through the Word that we are to learn to trace out and to see each one woven in uh, all through the truth, all bound together. And here is an added thought to Romans 8.28. For all things are for your sakes. Well, what is the primary principle that God has in mind for each one of us? Simply that we might be conformed to the image of his Son, that uh, 
he might live in and through us, manifest himself in and through us. And that's why that's why the Holy Spirit is working all these things together to that end, to that purpose, that we might grow. And not to uh, spoil things for us or make things hard for us or give us a hard time, so to speak. Never, never. Everything is geared for his wonderful purpose, for each one of us. For all things are for your sakes, for our development. True, many of them are for the, the uh, downfall and the crucifixion of the old life, but uh, at the same time, our new life develops out of the death of the old. Resurrection life springs out of death. So all things, whether negative or positive, they're all for our sakes. That the abundant grace, abundant grace, and it's grace too, it's free. It's all in the mercy and grace of God. The abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Well, it's a Christian who knows these principles. A Christian who realizes what God's doing is the one who can be thankful in the midst of it all the one uh, in whom God can be glorified. And it's the Christian who doesn't understand what's going on and who doesn't realize what God's principles are, his principles of working, who, when he's uh, taken down into a difficult place, he thanksgiving is the last thing he, he thinks of. And he never uh, realizes that this is a matter of grace. And there's a grumbling and uh, crying out and uh, praying to God to relieve the situation and get me out of this and uh, going from Christian to Christian for uh, help and advice and running to the pastor and getting this one and that one to pray for us. And uh, the fact is that uh, anyone, any praying about this uh, to relieve the situation is as often as not, is praying against the will of God. So how can God uh, answer that prayer? That's not according to his will. But what God is waiting for is for the Christian to see that uh, he is working this situation out. He has created it. Uh, true, uh, the circumstance may be, uh, a difficult circumstance may be the result of uh, our own fault and our own sin. We get into these things ourselves. But uh, underneath it all, God is using it to teach us, and to train us, and to show us what self is like, and to cause us to appreciate His grace, and to need His grace, and to rest in His faithfulness and His sovereignty. Uh, all these things are needed for that, for our development. We, we won't develop on our own. We we avoid the, the difficult situations. We want everything to be uh, just perfect all the time. We want to have it better than Paul and better than the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, the things that God works out, all of these things are, are exactly what we need. And they're all accruing, they're all developing for our personal growth, being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So that as we learn this, we think of uh, verse 16, for which cause we faint not. Uh, our knees don't bend and our hands don't drop down and uh, we wilt under the whole thing, but we rejoice. And we're thankful in the midst of all of this uh, pressure and difficult difficulty. But though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The new life is what counts. The old life doesn't count. Actually, our body doesn't really count. It's uh, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ within that counts. Not that we're not to uh, take care of our bodies and all, but certainly the life, the life of the Lord Jesus, our newly created Christian life is what really counts. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. All the affliction, uh, the chastisement, the child training comes from God's hand. He may use our, our sin to apply it, but it comes from God's hand. And it's light when you think of Paul, when you think of the Lord Jesus, and when you think of a lot of other Christians that you know about, it's light. It's light when you think of a lot of the unsaved, the things they're going through. In comparison, it's light. And it's but for a moment. It's uh, but for the time that God intends to use it for our development, and then he'll relieve it. Some, for some it may be extended, but God gives grace in the midst of it, no matter how long. And it's never any longer than he intends to have it. Thoroughly under his control, right from his hand. And uh, the wonderful thing is that it's not only for our development now, but it's for our eternal development. It's not only for time, but it's going to be for eternity. So it behooves us to allow the Holy Spirit to do a thorough and deep work because he's doing it for uh, the time that will be in glory, too, all, all through eternity. So we want it to be right. We want it to be uh, according to God's will. We want it to be for his glory, that he can be glorified in all of this uh, throughout eternity. Not only now. It may redound to the glory of God forever. And uh, in verse 18, while well, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And uh, God wants us to see his hand behind all of these things and to uh, see his eternal work going on in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who in turn hides himself and who in turn doesn't speak of himself. Spiritual growth uh, in the hands of the Holy Spirit is a deep work, and it's a hidden work. And as it is developed, then in turn it's manifested in our daily walk. As these truths and uh, realities are established in our lives, then there is the outworking Our, our faith in our sovereign God and our sovereign Father is going to enable us to see clearly God's hand in all of these things that he takes us through and allows us to go through. Things that we're taken through. Taken through. You remember in the classic example of God's sovereignty in the book of Job where Satan came into the picture. And even there, <clears throat> we learn that Satan is not master at all under any circumstances, that he's purely a servant. He's a servant of God. True, he's a satanic servant, but God uses him. And God never lets him gain the mastery in any in any situation. Never. Satan was defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary forever. And any activities that Satan has as of, from, uh, as of that moment, from the cross on through, uh, and today, he is controlled by God and controlled by God for God's ultimate purposes for everyone. And it's shown very clearly in the instance of Job that when Job wanted to afflict God, he knew better than to do it himself. He said to God, uh, Put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. God had to uh, work this thing out to develop Job and to prove to Satan this wonderful fact about those who believe in God, that they trust God and that God doesn't fail them, no matter what they have to go through. So Satan had to say to God, put forth thine hand now and touch him. 
and all that God uh, took Job through, all that Satan uh, engineered, uh, turned out to be exactly what Job needed to develop him spiritually. And we must remember that uh, anything that Satan might seek to do to us as Christians is uh, in turn controlled by our Father, by his hand. For all things are for your sakes, the word of God says. And it all uh, redounds to his glory. So, dear friends, we have an awful lot to be thankful for in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he uh, first teaches us, he shall teach you all things, and the basic main things that he teaches us are the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom everything is centered, and we're centered in him. He's the source of our life, our Christian life. And he, he turns our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. He's the one who, who uh, fastens our hearts and eyes upon him. That's his ministry. And uh, one of the ways he does this is by taking us through difficult places where our need is built up and we can't handle the situation and it becomes... Uh, too difficult for us, we feel, well, all there's left to do is to turn to the Savior, we feel. It's come to that. Think of it, how he has to deal with us. But what we want to realize is that the truth that the Holy Spirit reveals to us is the truth that he's seeking to develop in our lives that that the reality of those truths becomes reality in our Christian life. And so he focuses our attention and our hearts upon the Lord Jesus that he might become a reality that he might be manifest in our mortal flesh. That our Christian life might be more and more not I but Christ, the difficult things are the things that deal with self and sin. The result of that dealing is the wonderful life of the Lord Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit being developed in our daily life. Love, joy, peace, patience, all of these things that are developed through the hardships. So that we rest in the Lord Jesus and we depend upon the Holy Spirit. Our Father, we thank Thee for this time together, and we pray that Thou wilt enable us to get to know the Holy Spirit better and uh, to realize more fully how He works and uh, the end to which He works, that everything in our lives might be centered in the Lord Jesus, as we go through this world. How we thank thee for the faithfulness of the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who stands by the Word of God, who maintains the Word of God, who opens up the Word of God to our hearts, and keeps us standing upon the Word. And then as he teaches us the Word, he gives us the Word. He gives us the truth of the Word in our daily life, in our daily walk. The very life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we can't thank Thee enough for this. And we pray that our hearts might be ever more and for more of Him. That He might be our all in all in experience. In this poor, needy world. That others might, be see, might see Him and be drawn to Him. We trust Thee for this in His precious name. Amen.